The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Thank you for joining me again this evening. You've tuned into Your Money, Your Call, and we're all ready to deliver your weekly dose of property information and education. Now, before I introduce you to my guest this evening, let's take a look at a couple of news headlines and a new analysis from NAB has identified which property markets will perform the best and the worst over the coming years. The Queensland market came out on top with growth of 3.1% predicted over the next 24 months. Nonetheless, expectations have eased since the first quarter of 2014 when two-year growth of over 4% was forecast. Victoria also tipped for a strong performance in the next two years with capital growth of 2.4%. Current growth leader New South Wales is expected to fall back to growth of just 2%. In the rental market, however, New South Wales will surge ahead with predicted rent increases of 2.4%. Queensland will also provide solid rental growth of 1.8% in the two-year period. Western Australia came bottom of the pack in both the rental and sales sectors. Over the next two years, capital growth in the state is expected to be around 0.9%. And three state governments are sending warning letters to property spruikers amid growing concern about high pressure tactics used on consumers at seminars across the country. Property spruikers operate nationally and typically hold free seminars selling a range of options to invest in property. Western Australia, New South Wales and Victoria have sent letters to dozens of spruikers warning them that they must abide by Australian consumer law or they could be hit with penalties of up to $1.1 million. They say that they want to make sure that investors aren't feeling pressured into signing anything on the night, that they're given plenty of time and also understand that those operating in this space must give a 10-day cooling off period. Tonight we're talking property economics and depreciation and of course we'll answer any of your particular questions on any topic. Now to help me do that, I've asked regular experts Brad Beer from BMT and Andrew Wilson from Australian Property Monitors. And so if you have a question for anyone on the panel, this evening don't wait call us right now on 1300 30 34 35 or email your question to me right now at property at skynews.com.au welcome to the program and let's get started welcome to you both hi margaret hi. you know it's interesting when i was reading um Andrew, the stories about the growth rates and the fact that New South yes. Wales is going to peg back a little according to the experts mm. and then the rents will grow. I've always said that there's usually in a normal market a real cycle between first of all the values grow and of course that leaves rental yields behind. Yes. And when property prices flatten we tend to see rental yields catch up again. Yes. That looks like that's going to be what happens. Well, well those numbers were very skinny from NAB weren't they? I'm not sure whether they were referring to real prices growth so they were taking out the inflation component but I believe that reflected a survey of professionals of real estate agents so it might be a little bit of on the ground buzz that sort of made them project where they are now uh, to where they're going to be in two years time. I think generally our markets are travelling pretty well at the moment to be quite honest. Uh, there's no real sign of an overshoot in that Sydney investor market. In fact quite the opposite. Some amazing figures out of the ABS today showed that uh, uh, New South Wales investors borrowed over five billion dollars uh, over May which is an all-time record mm. uh, and we're tracking actual rent increases in Sydney at the moment so I think a number of factors are keeping that market in balance at the moment mm. but certainly very large numbers of investors and uh, that'll keep that market ticking over and prices growing. Andrew you've got to ask the question though with the median house price somewhere in the 770s. A bit higher. And a bit higher now. <laughs> and the average family's affordability yes. somewhere in the 680s or the even a little bit lower I think at 660. There's a big mismatch between that. 
Who's buying the property? Well, look, there is a lot of changeover buyer activity. So those changeover buyers bring equity into the proposition. So it's that uh, ripple effect, effect that moves through the market. And we've seen that really work its way through the outer suburbs of Sydney into the middle, middle ring. And the, and the real energy markets have been the upper North Shore and the inner, uh, the inner West. Um, and it is that, uh, of course, the low interest rates have activated increased capacity to borrow uh, because that has taken those average Sydney repayments down from around $600 a week for the average loan to around $500 a week. And that's why we're getting the prices growth. Now, it will end because interest rates aren't going anywhere, certainly not up and possibly not down either. So it will rely now on just incomes growth to fuel prices, uh, to fuel prices growth, and incomes are actually going backwards when yes. we take out inflation. Yeah, so exactly. I, I think we're getting a period of quite stable prices growth, which is a good thing for everybody, I we're think, going, going to forward. To just, we're going to have to hit that kind of top end at some Stage oh, well, and I think we're nearly there now, and, and that's a balancing out act. But uh, the New South Wales economy is doing very well. Over 70,000 uh, international migrants into New South Wales last year. They've got to live somewhere, mm. and I think that's part of what's keeping yeah. those increased in investor properties from uh, overbalancing. I agree. Brad, Spruikers, well, it's about time they did something, but I don't know if you've read the letter that they're sending to the Spruikers, but it's pretty much... The Spruikers are just going to, you know flip them the bird and just continue to do what they're doing. And, and look, uh, I haven't actually read the letter, but from every all of the, the reports I did read, um, where it was a bit of a, you know, realise that there's some rules in place and there's, there's rules in place. Um, now, now th and, and they're there, but we've got to actually abide by them and actually going, you know, we really need to, to, to look at these rules and, and make sure that they're, they're tough enough, I suppose. And, um, as a buyer, if you you know if you if you're coming um, and, and looking at properties and you're going to seminars and and you, you've really got to look at the fundamental reason to invest in property and look at the type of property you're actually buying and making sure it's the the things that you believe are going to make some money over time. Yeah, if you're going to the seminar of a person who just happens to be selling property in an area that they also claim is the next hot spot, it's a bit too coincidental, isn't it? <laughs> Well, sometimes that's a bit, bit coincidental. Sometimes it could be the right property. Uh, so you really need to have a, a good hard look at what it actually is. Um, if they've got it for sale, you've got to think, well, is it still definitely OK? You know, talk, we're talk, they're talking about cooling off periods on the seminars and things like that. And but look, the, the problem, as far as I can see it with all of this, is that you've got them, uh, you've got ASIC threatening these people with the Department of Fair Trading because of the consumer laws and misleading and deceptive conduct. You've got ASIC with no powers to do anything. There isn't a law to cover property investment advisors, so there's nothing for ASIC to go after them under. Yet the real problem is, or one of the main problems, is that property is being sold with massive commissions built in, the investor takes delivery of it way over market value and when they're skinny on equity or tight on finances and the person selling it has got no legal requirement to do any kind of um, assessment of that person's individual financial circumstances, we see people getting into trouble. And I've seen complaints made to the Department of Fair Trading and quite frankly they're completely toothless, they do nothing. And you've really, as, a, as an investor into those, those types of properties, what, or in any type of property, you've really got to have a, um, an independent look at that, someone independent to go, well, what, what, is, what is the properties in the next suburb that are not the new one you're looking at? What are they selling for? What is the, the fundamental ability for, the, for that rental amount? Is that rental amount inflated that it's sort of quoted as maybe you're going to get? Is there anything that's actually um, pushing the value of this property up, up over above where it should actually be? Um, in that current market. Um, and if that is the case, then you've really got to look at what else is there. Mm. Um. The, the realities are, Andrew, that it doesn't matter what that person or the spruker says at the seminar, it doesn't matter what they promise you about the future rent returns or the future value, if it doesn't get delivered, which most often it doesn't, there is absolutely nothing that anybody can do about it. No, and it's, look, it's one of the byproducts of a hot market is we get a lot of this speculative activity happening and we get a lot of enterprises coming in from left field taking advantage of what we do know is a strong above average capital capital growth, uh, a peak point of the cycle. Uh, and we're not, we can't really crystal ball gaze to see that shorter to medium term outcome. But I do think it's always about buyer beware. And it's also about taking that medium to longer term view, not just in terms of your capital gains requirements, but also your capacity to finance your property and your investment as well. Mm.
Brad, do you look, look like think, you're about to say something? I, I think a big word there is transparency. Look for some transparency on whatever it is you're, you're buying. Um, <laughs> that, that, that they're, not, they're disclosing everything that's going on and you know that it's a reasonable amount of commission anything that's actually happening. And if it's, if it's inflated and it's increasing the, property, the price of the property by too much, then it's, it's probably not going to work. I think that's the problem though because there's no requirement for that commission to even be disclosed if it's disguised the right way. And often these spruikers don't call it a sales commission because many of them don't have real estate licenses so they're not actually selling to you they call themselves marketers or you know agents for the developer and they don't they're not actually selling they're just introducing it to you through a property seminar and therefore the commissions are also hidden because there's no requirement to disclose it it's a kickback from the developer once settlement happens and you know we see 40 50 sometimes sixty thousand dollars built in I know that for a fact because that's what I've personally been offered to sell property to my clients um, wow. and I've been told that, it do, that the clients don't have to know that this amount's being popped on to the, the purchase price that is coming from developer profit. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be sitting here if I took up that offer, I'd be off somewhere on wow. a, a lovely island somewhere. I'm sure I would have had the capacity to sell a lot of those kinds of things. So I think this is the biggest problem. Um, ASIC isn't and the government is doing nothing to stop this happening and to, to make them disclose their commissions. And your investor will end up burnt. And uh, I think, you know, I, I hear numbers, 60 odd percent, I think of investors in Australia only end up one, buying one property. Yeah. And a lot of the time it's because they buy one maybe of that type or they get burnt by whatever it is by not covering whatever risk there is investing in property. And then you end up going, this is too hard and, and, I, and I lose money. So it's not as good as it sounds. Well, fortunately, there's, you know, a little bit more education around these days. So make sure you get yours before you go ahead and buy any kind of property. Well, I'm glad that you joined us this evening. As you know, every Monday night, the panel and I will choose one question from either the emails or the calls and send a copy of one of my books. Now this week the best email will receive investing in the right property now a book all about growth drivers call us on 1300 30 3435 or email property at skynews.com.au with a question and then make sure that you watch at the end of the show to see if you're the lucky person we're off for a short break don't go away when we come back we'll take some more calls and we'll answer your questions Welcome back. Joining me tonight is Brad Beer from BMT and Andrew Wilson from Australian Property Monitors. And we're here to make sure that you get the answers that you need. Now, if you have a question, grab the phone and call us on 1330 3435, or of course, you can email us on property at skynews.com.au. Paul from Melbourne, welcome to the program, Paul. Hi, Margaret. How can we help you? Um, I was, we have a couple of properties in Melbourne, and we're looking to get our third one in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been looking at Runcorn and surrounding um, suburbs in, in the 15k um, ring. Um, also, I'm interested in Meadowbrook in the, in the Logan area. We've got about 350 to spend. Um, I'm just wondering what you think as towards what would be the smartest buy. Okay, now did the panel get that? No? Yes, I got yes, that. Yes, got that. Yeah. Okay, so I'll um, just explain it again. The, the, look, Paul's looking to diversify into Queensland. He's looking at either Runcorn or um, Meadowbank near uh, Logan. Logan, yeah. Um, what do you think? Well, look, um, uh, Logan's due. Is it due, Margaret? Well, it's done it once already because I actually bought there eight years ago and it doubled in value fairly shortly thereafter. But that's from eighty thousand to one hundred and sixty. Well, yes, it won't be eighty 000. now. Um, but, uh, and so, yes, it's absolutely, definitely due. Yeah, so maybe a good uh, medium-term, longer-term view there. Get in at the bottom. Mm. Um, the Queensland, southeast Queensland, is becoming more vibrant by the minute. Mm. So uh, that'll pick up that energy eventually. Mm. Uh, and it's good value buying there. That corridor between the Gold Coast and Brisbane is uh, is really starting to uh, attract buyers mm. and there's a lot of value in Logan and it's been a, an underperformer I think we must say that but that's what you want isn't it if mm. you're looking to uh, to get in for the longer haul and um, you know get a good return and I think I think that's quite a, a legitimate uh, prospect a couple of weeks ago one of the current affairs programs did a story on Logan uh, because apparently the locals called it Bogan which is quite uncharitable, really. Not very it's nice. shrugging off its uh, former shroud, Brad. But it is, you know, it really qualifies under that growth, under supply, population growing, very heavy family demographic there, average age around about 34, so lower than the national average, so a young demographic there. Normally that kicks 
probably along a bit, doesn't it? And and I like those type of areas. I, I don't have a problem with. Um, I, don't, I don't know about Bogan, but <laughs> I don't have a problem with, with investing in that type of area because generally the, uh, the the cash flows and I've and I've bought in that area not that long ago, and I think the cash flows often are quite good. Um, your risk is somewhat reduced sometimes based on the fact that you're not um, in really high priced property that. Uh, and, and I, sp I spread my risk between multiple properties instead of one really high priced property, I suppose. Um, and I don't I have issues with that area. I think it's still got some, some, some things to run. Mm. Yeah, look, Paul, out of the two areas or the two suburbs, which are both situated very similarly or fairly close to each other, Runcorn is actually my pick. Runcorn is on the north to northwestern side of Logan heading back toward Brisbane and it's already started to move a little bit faster than anything else there so if you're going to buy something there it's going to have to be fairly soon you might have to look at a townhouse at the moment and there are quite a few townhouses around there but it's kind of at that top edge and it's really bordering on some of those better suburbs as well and that would definitely be my pick the thing about an area like Logan is that what you get from it is I believe you get more bang for your buck because you have sustained growth over a long period of time so while we're not going to see you suddenly get a boom there where it doubles in value again and I don't believe that that's going to happen I think that's in the past from when it was a really a very very cheap suburb what you will get happening is you'll get year on year growth for quite a long time and the rental growth will follow through as well that's because there is an undersupply there a lot of the established houses are currently quite under pressure in those areas and there's also a lot going on. I was driving through there again just uh, last week on my way out to Chinchilla and Dalby noticing the huge amount of infrastructure that's going in there, both transport and otherwise. So lifestyle catering, uh, parks, some more schools and there's a few good pub, uh, private schools down there now as well and we're seeing a lot of new shopping centres and it's really started to get that feeling that there's a buzz there. Uh, the Mayor Pam Parker, uh, she's the Mayor of Logan, she also tells me they have a huge amount of foreign investment interest in the area from a commercial perspective and of course when that happens then we always know that we can see some great residential property price growth follow suit. I think it's a great pick for you and certainly one that you need to get in on as quickly as you can. Well, it's time to take a break, but we'll answer some more questions on our return. Be sure to call us on 1300 30 3435 or email property at skynews.com.au with a question. And then make sure that you watch at the end of the show to see if you're the lucky person to get hold of a copy of one of my books. We'll be right back. Thanks for sticking around tonight. Brad Beer from BMT and Andrew Wilson from Australian Property Monitors are doing a great job answering your questions. So call us now on 1300 30 34 35 to join the queue where you can email us on property at skynews.com.au. Peter from Lismore, lovely to have you on the program, Peter. Thank you, Margaret. Lovely to have you. Margaret, I've got two properties here in Lismore. Um, I was just wanting to know what yourself or the panel thought of Lismore or the Northern Rivers of New South Wales for future growth. Okay, good question. Yes. I um, am going to be heading up there actually in a little while. Just came back. Peak on Grafton, you just came back. So what did you find? Well, the, the seaside part of the Northern Rivers equation is certainly up and running. Ballina, Ballina. very good, yep. very strong. Uh, all the way down to Coffs Harbour, really. I mean, that's a that's a big region. Lismore's probably next cab off the rank internal. Doesn't have quite the same sort of energy that uh, that Ballina has specifically, um, and also Byron Bay is doing very well. So it is picking up on the value aspect of those seaside properties, which have been down for a couple of years. So uh, Lismore's a bit more s uh, slow and steady, um, but I think over time that'll work its way through into that market. But because it doesn't have that uh, that seaside aspect, it's not picking up as the early quickly. stages the other ones are at the moment. As quickly. What do you think Brad? You sometimes do invest in Lismore-like areas. And I have um, probably some, not in Lismore, but similar areas to, areas to that and uh, I've never had fantastic growth out of those areas and I think they're, they're driven by the, the local wage or, or the local economy a little bit um, and I don't seem to get massive amount of growth out of them. Now 
I've got not bad cash flow out of those properties though over the time and uh, I think Lismore's got a uni which I've got uni uni sort of close properties but it's in a bigger area probably Hunter and there's more than just a uni that sort of drives I suppose the the tenants there um, it does uh, or the tenancies um, the tenants do um, the uni puts some pressure on the market so I get more opportunity for tenants as long as I'm vacant at about the right time which is a good thing but Lismore has um, it is a smaller town that I have um, not had as much luck in. Mm. Uh, Peter, I've got to be honest, I, I don't see that you're going to get the kind of growth that you could get maybe investing elsewhere, but as Brad says, one of the things about areas like Lismore is the cash flow tends to be fairly consistent and at least you're covering your costs and you're getting some growth out of that area. The reason why I'm saying that to you is because I know you live in Lismore and I know you have two properties in Lismore, I don't want to see you investing any more in Lismore. Not only should you be diversifying anyway because you shouldn't have more than one or two properties properties in any one area but I guess you think that because you live there you know the area well but you don't know what it takes to make an area grow from an investment perspective you probably know all about this more from a lifestyle point of view and from a residents point of view but not from an investors point of view I'd prefer to see you buy elsewhere for your next properties. I'm not suggesting you sell these more I think they'll be okay for you I just think if you really want to get some of that great growth that everyone's getting in on in other areas. This is the year of the capital city, albeit the outer suburbs of the capital city, and I'd rather see you get into something a little bit more like that than have any more in the country, which of course Lismore definitely is. Well, in our first email tonight, Stephen has a question about valuations, and he says, I believe the key part of a successful property investment strategy is to regularly review my portfolio's performance to ensure my money is working hard for me. To do this, I would like to get a valuation of my property portfolio. What's your advice on obtaining reliable property valuations without the expense of engaging a licensed valuer? I'd like to review my portfolio on an annual basis. Good question, Brad, because I know you do this because you've got a fairly large portfolio and you always want to know what the values are. But if you engage a licensed valuer, you don't get any of these cheap $180 that they charge the bank. They're going to charge you four or $500 per property. And it's an expensive way to find out what they're worth. And so what I, what I tend to do is rather than actually get real valuations on them by the, the valuer each time is I'm looking at the appropriate sites. You can get a fair bit of information about what's around in the streets these days and what's sold and what hasn't sold through a, a range of different websites. And I guess I'm, I'm someone who probably revalues my property and pulls equity out of them so I can make sure I've got as much cash free as possible, a bit more regularly as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the, 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 there's plenty of actual websites where you can actually find out what else is sold these days. It's amazing what information you can actually get a hold of. Of course, we need to be careful as well, Andrew. Some of those websites have guesstimates, which are really only based on the last sale price plus the annual growth rate. Well, well, sometimes well that's right, Margaret. And the whole process of valuation is you need some sales to get some sense of what's happening. And it's a good question. It sounds like a bit of an ad, but APM Price Finder, of course, have products that allow you to subscribe and have very, very uh, sophisticated and rigorous uh, modelling of, uh, of house prices. So at the end of the day, you know, a house price can be an, an ethereal type of uh, concept. Mm. But certainly APM Price Finder, uh, even though I is part of the domain uh, group, is uh, somewhere where they can offer you some so that, without paying the for the value. Um, APMPriceFinder.com.au. Yeah, yeah, price more than you come and do this for me on a Monday night, I'm more than happy for you to promote that yeah, that's uh, to all the viewers. Good, yeah. And it's some good advice there, Stephen. You could, there's a lot of web-based stuff you can get. Be very, very very careful that you don't go in, uh, onto those uh, websites that are just doing the guesstimates because they might not be right. But more importantly, you want to look at past sales and those kinds of websites have what's been selling recently. And don't forget that if something looks like your property and is right near your property, it's likely to be very similar value to your property as well, regardless of whether yours is prettier or has nicer decorating. The prices are all pretty much the same from property to property. Well, this is Your Money, Your Call, and we're having a great night, but we do need to take another break. It won't be long, so stay tuned and perhaps even call us now on 1330 3435, or you can email us on property at skynews.com.au. We'll be right back.
Thanks for joining me tonight. I'm Margaret Lomas and with me on my expert panel is Brad Beer from BMT and Andrew Wilson from Australian Property Monitors. Now we've been taking your calls and if you have a question call us right now on 1300 30 34 or email us on property at skynews.com.au. But before we do get to more questions you should know that this weekend the Sydney Home Buyer Show is on at a new venue, the Sydney Showgrounds at Olympic Park. Now all three of us, Brad, Andrew and I, will all be speaking at the show each day so you're going to get a fabulous amount of information and it's education that you simply can't miss. I've secured some free tickets for you to save you some money and to get those go to my website destiny.com.au click on the home buyer show logo and use the promo code destiny. We all look forward to seeing you there this weekend. Rob from Sydney welcome to the program Rob. Oh, hi Margaret. How Thanks you going? For taking my call. Yeah good. Um, look, I've got a question in regards to, I'm trying to diversify the properties in Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, my next area was South East Queensland, <clears throat> but there's been a lot of talk recently and that usually concerns me. Mm -hmm. um, the area I'd like to talk about is uh, Wollongong. I found a very interesting article in the Australian Property Investor magazine where John Edwards talked about <clears throat> his uh, top suburbs and he talked about Wollongong with potential growth because it's been flat for a long period of time. Um, and I just thought that uh, the area was on the improve. The council was putting in money, the universities are uh, extending there. It's close to Sydney. People are getting priced out of Sydney. It's on the coast. Um, and I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Okay, well of course uh, Wollongong was in liquidation for a while, the council, Absolutely, and yeah. um, I think one of the things, there's two things that I really want to point out early on here, and of course you'll jump all over me if you think I'm wrong, but Not just really. because an area has been flat for a long time doesn't mean it's about to grow, and being near the coast doesn't always mean that it's going to be a fabulous area to invest. No, that's right, Margaret. And uh, Wollongong really had some troubles two years ago when they closed the steel mills and there was some, a lot of issues there and concerns that that would impact the local economy and then move through uh, with that uh, negative impact generally in, uh, in terms of uh, housing market activity. But uh, it hasn't translated into that, actually. Wollongong has kept moving along and there was some certainly compensation packages as a part of that process of, um, uh, I guess it's a big picture in Australia now with manufacturing moving down into other uh, areas in terms of economic activity but uh, Wollongong uh, for my tracking has been uh, you know uh, has certainly been uh, a resilient and robust market re recently certainly not the Sydney-esque type of double figure growth but it does pick up the adjacent energy from Sydney as the mm -hmm. caller said uh, and I do think that that has good prospects moving forward I mean it will be a commute for people who do want to uh, be part of the Sydney base and not pay those million dollar plus mm -hmm. prices you know and it still has a lifestyle aspect to it. Mm, pretty easy commute really too, Brad. I know people commute from where I live. I'm in Terrigal. Um, you know, people commute from the Central Coast and we're seeing the same things happening there as well. The Sydney spillover as people perceive that the Sydney Western suburbs have now become unaffordable. They're spilling over into both Wollongong and Central Coast. But I guess you, you would have to move pretty quick. Um, yeah, look, I, I tend to agree with you that I guess flat doesn't necessarily mean growth because um, having some of those things that impact on that impact or impacted on that market that mean there's not as many jobs there and things like that, they can hang around for a long time. And what is the likelihood for the demand to be taken up? But I do like the concept of um, the, the spillover from Sydney, like Western Sydney's become, it's been pretty hot for some period of time now and suddenly the Central Coast for example or Wollongong or Newcastle start to look more attractive and I tend to like the coast, <laughs> but that's a personal, but then a lot of people do like the coast, um, mm -hmm. I like the water, so you, you've kind of got a bit of that there, definitely. And the joker in the pack is Badgerys Creek. Yes. I mean, we're going to see a split in that Sydney basin. Parramatta will become a major urban centre. So everything moving. So we've got to rethink this whole scenario. Mm -hmm. And areas such as Wollongong will become lifestyle markets, not for Sydney. They'll be adjacent to that whole southeast. People miss that, don't they? They miss this whole satellite city thing. Yes, yes, yes. Liverpool's a city. Parramatta's a city. People go, oh, but you know, they're a long way from Sydney. But the people who live there never need to go to That's Sydney. That's right. And they the jobs go are going to, to open up between Parramatta and Badgerys. 
Menagerie's Absolutely. Creek and it'll become what we need Absolutely. is a fill, an infill type of city. I agree. And you know, from my perspective, I don't think you can go wrong with either of them, Wollongong or South East Queensland. I see very similar markets in both of them. If you're not talking about the waterfront of Wollongong, but you're talking about the suburbs of Wollongong, it feels very like a lot of those suburbs and those waterside suburbs around the Logan Shire. And Logan Shire is gaining that same kind of momentum. So you said that you've been a little bit frightened off from the South East Queensland market by the news reports, but there's, as far as I can see, it's all good news. I think either one of those. Why don't you buy one in each? That's probably the best way to go. Don't, you don't, don't split the difference. Just buy one in each. They're both affordable, and it's probably something that you can definitely afford to do. Sam wants to start his investing off with an off-the-plan purchase. And he asked the panel, I've been looking at purchasing a one-bedroom apartment off the plan in Kelvin Grove in Brisbane for 436000 as an investment property. How do you feel about this as an investment? It will have a lot of depreciation to claim, but it will be negative cash flow for a while with very expensive strata. Should I be looking for a pre-existing building where cash flow would be more neutral to positive? Brad, from a depreciation perspective, those brand new is a pretty good, but if you get something that's a year or two old, not a lot of difference, is there? Yeah, that's, that's correct. The, the new has got a, everything in there new, so it's, that's when it's got its highest value, it's got its um, nothing second hand, so your depreciation is definitely higher. Two years old is not a whole lot different though. Um, it's definitely a bit less, but uh, you know, such a large building component and we're looking one bedroom unit. There's a lot of, there's a lot of plant equipment in a one bedroom unit as a percentage because you're in a building with a lot of common areas um, and your depreciation on that will be quite good. But as it was said in the email, there's also strata fees with that. So more depreciation or, or tax reasons are not the reason to buy a certain type of property. Don't buy it just because of that. That's a bonus definitely and, and the cash flow after tax will be a bit better, but even though I'm the depreciation guy... Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> hey, you're talking yourself out of business. I, I'm not, because, I, look, old property still gets it. Mm -hmm. A couple of years older still gets it and still gets almost as much. It's still there, uh, and you've got to really believe in the, in, in the actual property's cash flow across the board, its ability to grow over a period of time, not just its depreciation, because it's there on everything. But, yes, it is definitely higher. Mm. You know, I guess the, the, the danger to point out here, Andrew, is that a lot of people don't realise that when you're buying off the plan, it's very difficult to get comparative values, particularly in a place like Kelvin Grove. Yes. There's a lot of these units going Absolutely, up at the moment. Yes. It's yeah, just that, that north by northwest from that's Brisbane. Right, that's right. Starting to... It's north by northwest, and then we've got south by southwest, which is working as well. I think it's, I'm not quite sure, but uh, you know, we have Hamilton and, and New Farm and yes. those areas, infill, brownfill, uh, brown, uh, brownfield sites. Yeah. And we are maybe seeing a little bit of oversupply in those areas. We are definitely tracking prices down on new apartments in those outer or middle outer, inner middle outer suburbs of Brisbane in uh, new apartments. In the middle outer. Well, you know what I'm saying. I mean, uh, but, but, the interesting, but the interesting thing is that that the the inner inner, which is the CVD, is doing very well in Brisbane. Um, but uh, you know, there, there certainly is a lot of building going on in new apartments in Brisbane. We are tracking softening in rentals uh, in those particular areas. I would personally be looking for something more established in Brisbane. I think there's an upside as long as it's within, say, about 10 k's mm -hmm. of the CBD, particularly for that price range that we were speaking about mm -hmm. then. Uh, some estimates put about 70% of all new purchases of the off-the-plan apartments going to investors, mm -hmm. which means that they're going to be further flooding the rental market there. Uh, the floods and all the issues that they had up in Brisbane put paid to a lot of uh, developments that were in the making. They're all coming back right. on yes. at the same time. Mm -hmm. We've been forecasting this oversupply of Brisbane units for a while Absolutely. now. Absolutely. It's definitely coming to fruition. I'd be very, very careful, Stephen, about your first investment property. And off the plan is highly dangerous because a whole lot of reasons. First of all, you don't really know whether it's at market value. They usually try to predict a future value and put it on top, and that's what you're paying. In the olden days, it wasn't like that. In the olden days, you bought off the plan at today's price because you're taking a bit of a risk with the developer. It doesn't happen like that anymore. Of course, the other problem is that you can't forecast that future supply. You don't know, even though the market might seem like it's renting well now, when the time comes, everyone's going to settle when you settle. Straight away, that impacts on your value. It impacts on your ability to get a tenant and it impacts on your rent return. Plus all those high strata fees, you could find yourself with a negative cash flow property that's worth less than you're paying for it. Um, and there's all those commissions built in usually to off the plan as well. 
well, you know, you could be in a bad way. Better to go with something that you can get today, that you can confirm the value today, you can confirm the rental return today, and then you can move on to the next property more quickly because you're not waiting around for one to settle in three or four years' time. Thanks for being with us. We're off for a break again, but when we return, you'll have another chance to ask your questions simply by calling us on 1300 30 34 35 or emailing us on property at skynews.com.au. Welcome back. I'm Margaret Lomas and I've been getting a great helping hand from Brad Beer from BMT and Andrew Wilson from Australian Property Monitors. If you have a question, call us now on 1300 30 3435 or email us on property at skynews.com.au. Stephen from Perth, thanks for calling all the way from Perth. How are you Hello, going? Hello, Margaret. Hi, Stephen. Hi, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. I have a question. I have a portfolio of four properties and I annually review the portfolio to see how hard my money is working for me and what uh, equity I have available. Uh -huh. And I'm, I'm looking for some advice from the, the panel on the best way to value a property portfolio on an annual basis without incurring the expense of engaging a licensed valuer each year for, for each property. Now Stephen, what were you doing before you switched on our show tonight? Uh, Were you I was watching actually, that other show? Uh, no, oh. no, I was, I was actually working, doing a bit of work from home. Okay, because we've already answered your question. You emailed it to me through the week. I did, yes. Oh, you got my email. We've got your email and we've answered it tonight already. <laughs> So okay. You're going to have to do a quick rewind so that we don't have to go through it all again. But we gave you some fabulous advice on what to do. Oh, fantastic. Thank so, you. I'll listen, I'll listen to the podcast. Have a listen to the podcast. Have you got Rewind on, your, on the TV? No, I don't, but I, I can get the podcast, so okay. that's great. Excellent. Look, just in a nutshell, very quickly. APM Price Finder provide a sophisticated and highly um, robust uh, uh, website that uh, allows you to value um, you know, individual properties, and uh, I recommend that, obviously, part of the domain group. And Brad? And, and you said th these days you can uh, you can get what has sold in your street that's similar to your house through websites similar to that and and see what it really should probably be worth because it's next door's probably sold for what it similar to what um, if it's a similar property to what it should be worth. Mm. So there you go. Go and have a listen to that, Stephen. And you're going to get your answers. Well, every now and then we get a question about whether it's best to buy units or houses, just like this one from Vanda, who asks, I'd like to know what you recommend for a first-time investor to purchase a unit or a house for rental. Brad, interesting. It's a, it's a regular question, and I think uh, um, units versus houses is more about units versus houses in a certain area. As a first-time investor, whether it's a unit or a house shouldn't be really your main question. Um, now, if you're looking at a certain area and you believe that's the type of property that you, or the, the area you're going to buy in, then is a unit or a house what renters want in that area? Um, you know, much of the studies that are done are, are um, you know, tracking unit versus house, gro house growth. I don't think there's a whole lot of one is way better than the other from a growth perspective. It's an area that needs small properties uh, and, and there's, there's people that will live in one or two bedrooms, then unit's okay. If it's an area that's full of families, a one bedroom unit is not too good. Um, so it really comes down, I think, more to the actual area and whether that's the type of stock that's going to be able to be rented and that people do want in that area. Mm. And it's true, isn't it, Andrew, that when you, we do the, the house price growth and we do the house growth, mm. uh, sorry, the unit, unit price growth, growth yeah. in any area, in some areas units beat houses and in other areas houses well, beat Well, it's all about the mix, isn't it? That's why typically we see when we track units and houses that there's a more volatile and looks like more growth happening in houses, but it's not. It's just the mix is for higher priced properties in houses because the range in houses uh, is more spread than it is in units in terms of prices. But very interesting and exactly what Brad said, um, it depends on the location, uh, it depends on what's happening in the market. Now in Sydney there is a real trend towards unit living now. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this, inner city living, the cosmopolitan lifestyle, people don't need the backyard anymore, they want to be uh, close to amenities, uh, a, a number of reasons uh, and, and affordability. 
facility. So we are staying to see not just buyers but also renters prefer units. So under those circumstances, units are an affordable option and also a more popular option. Similar in Melbourne, but we're talking suburban, mm. in a suburban rather than in a city style uh, new development. So um, yes, units can be depending on where they are and that's I guess where you look at horses for courses a better option than houses or maybe vice versa uh, in other locations. You know Vander I get very nervous when the first question that a new investor asks is should I buy a unit or a house because that's a question that should be coming at the end of all of the rest of your education. The first question that you should be asking is where should I be buying right now and working out which of the areas with the best capacity to grow in the future and the ones that can give you a short term good rental return so that you don't have too negative a cash flow while you're waiting for that growth to come. It's fabulous to get good growth but if you go broke waiting for it to come that's no good either. So you need to first of all learn how to find an area that has the best possible growth for the best possible cash flow. The next thing you then do is work out if you can afford to buy the average house in that area. If it's out of your price range you've got to go back to the drawing board and look elsewhere. Once you've done all of that and then you've asked all of the questions confirming the growth drivers, the population growth, the improving median household income and the infrastructure projects that could be happening in the future, then you ask the question who lives there? And just as the boys said, if it's families, you can't be buying a unit, you have to buy a house. If it's young, upwardly mobile professional couples, then it's likely they're going to be wanting a unit. Or if it's an ageing population, then maybe they want a villa with easy access so that they don't have to climb the stairs. The demographics will determine what you buy, but before you even get to that, you've got to be able to work out where you're going to buy, what you can afford, and becoming a bit more educated as an investor. Well, time's running out and we need to take another quick break, but you might still be able to get the question, your question answered if you hurry to the phone and you might be in the running for the book. So call us now on 1300 30 34 35 or you can email us on property at skynews.com.au. Welcome back. It's been a great night with my expert panel, Brad Beer from BMT and Andrew Wilson from Australian Property Monitors. That's it for callers this week, but during the week you can email your questions for next week to property at skynews.com.au. And here's an email that came in through the week from Ken. Ken says, would the panel members kindly provide their opinion re the likely price movement of residential property on Sydney's lower North Shore over the next six months, given that the market is now reported to be cooling? coming into the quieter winter period. First of all, it's not always quieter in winter. No, it's not. And it's, it? it's actually an illusion, Margaret, yes. because there's no real reason why, just because it's colder, you're not going to buy property. Well, there's a reason why I wouldn't, because I wouldn't go outside if it was a cold day. So we have auction rooms and we have the yeah, internet and all those the things. Room. I you know? leave the house. You know, but, uh, but it is because we, look, a, a lot of the reason is, we won't talk about the seasonality, that's one of my pet uh, topics, but we do focus beginning of the year and end of the year. Mm. And in the middle of the year, we've made our decision, we've done something, and then we maybe start thinking about the second part of the year, also school holidays do fit right in the middle of the year and there is a lot of breaks that occur and particularly for I guess the prestige property areas do take a lot of midwinter breaks so we do tend to see uh, it looks like prices are falling but what's happening is there are less higher price properties being sold yes. because the issues that drive lower price properties are not so affected by those winter distractions so that's that now the lower North Shore um, has certainly been actually an active market this year. We tracked the median rising uh, from 1,600,000 to 1,700,000 over the first three months of this year. Now it's tracked back to 1,680,000 over the June quarter but we still haven't got all our data in so look it is an active market. It's gone up by around 6% this year so far but it's coming from further behind from some of those other uh, areas in Sydney which have been very strong over the last uh, year or so where median house prices are up over 20%. The lower North Shore up around 12% over the last 12 months but starting to grow again because of the fact that it hasn't been part of that price rise energy. But we are talking prestige property here okay. uh, and the drivers of that really are different to the drivers of most of the other market. And I guess too Brad that if you're an investor 
it's unlikely that you're going to go out and pick up a couple of 1.68 million dollar properties and if you do they're only going to rent for about eight hundred dollars a week That's so no your yield. rental yield is going to be absolutely appalling so even if the lower north shore was going to do well that's good news for you for probably your owner occupied yes. property but you're unlikely unless you can really you really it's really got to perform andrew yes if it's only getting 800 dollars a week rent return you've got a big gap to fill yeah. up and Great. tough to find tenants sometimes in that price range at the moment because yes. we still don't have that prosperity yes. effect in in uh, in the market at the moment that we had three or four years ago uh, when that prestige market was going gangbusters yeah. Brad. And look, I think, uh, firstly, the, the, the question itself is what do we think it's going to do in six months? I think if you're going to invest in property, we've got to think about more than six months. Yeah, That's true. probably the most thing I'd say there on, on that question is that, that uh, six months is not going to make a whole lot of difference because it's really about longer term than that. And I think that... Um, the, the high price property in this sort of sort of area with such a low return, you know, that sort of three percent or sort of numbers is if, if. Y yeah, and, yeah, and if you if you think about what sort of growth you want to get from property, and when you crunch your numbers on what the cost of holding that property is, you need about you need a couple of percent growth before you even break even. Yeah, you do exactly, um, and that makes it much more difficult to actually, as a long term investment strategy, to to actually make wealth out of that. Now they're bigger numbers, so the number can be bigger, but it's more risky because you've got to hold that property through that through that uh, through that situation. You're the first to hurt if there's no renters around. Could be better to take your 1.68 million dollars, chop it into four, yes, and invest all around Australia in some of the fabulous areas that we've talked about tonight that will probably grow greater than the North Shore would anyway. That's all we have time for this week. I'll be back in two weeks, and next week Lisa Montgomery will take the chair for the evening, and helping her will be Peter Kulizos. So get those questions sent to. Me me and I'll pass them on. Thank you to my guests this week, Brad Beer from BMT and Andrew Wilson from Australian Property Monitors. You'll see them again very soon, particularly if you come to the Home Buyer Show on the weekend. Thanks also to our callers. Now this week our question of the week goes to Peter from Lismore. Peter, I think you need to know how to invest outside of Lismore, so I'd love you to have the book. If you could now email me on yourmoneyyourcall at destiny.com.au, there it is on the screen, yourmoneyyourcall at destiny.com.au, I will send you your book. Of course, that's the only question of the week winner. For everyone else, go online to my store at destiny.com.au or any good bookstore to get hold of any of my books. You can follow me on Twitter, Margaret Lomas AU, and also on Facebook. Don't forget also to sign up for my monthly newsletter, which you can do by going to destiny.com.au. Thanks for being with us. Have a great week and hopefully we'll see you at the Home Buyer Show on the weekend. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.